My name is Michael Gayad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Michael Knox, uh, who is uh, very ambitious given that he's got two designations after his name as opposed to one. I'm excited for this conversation. Michael had joined one of my prior spaces a while back, kept on coming back and engaged with him a bit uh, on DM. Uh, really super nice guy, super smart guy. I think this will be a worthwhile conversation. Mike, for those who are not familiar with your background, introduce yourself. Who are you? How'd you get interested and involved in markets? And exactly how much of an overachiever are you? <laughs> I don't know. If you'd have to talk to some of my old teachers about that overachiever thing, they'd probably get a good laugh. But uh, just a brief history of myself. I've uh, I've started trading since 2006 when actually in university there was a job fair and a, a prop firm was there. Uh, for those who don't know, prop firms back in the day, before HFTs and all this were fairly popular, the deal is you uh, trade our money. You eat what you kill. So if you make money in the markets, then we'll pay you a percentage of it. And if you lose money, you're out on the street holding a cup. So got started there, had a great time right away. It was an interesting contrast going from a you know efficient market hypothesis course and then literally leaving the class and running to the other end of my small town up here in Canada to the offices to then see that all of that was not exactly true. So I did that for a number of years. Uh, after the computerization of the market, a lot of these prop firms started to struggle. So uh, the one I was working in shut down. I went and I worked in hedge fund administration for 10 years. So this was around the Bernie Madoff time when everyone was terrified and no one really trusted the fund or the accountants or anything. So there became an industry for basically independent and hired by the investor funds that would then go and talk to these hedge fund managers and look through their books and try to figure out what they were trading. So you combine all that Bernie Madoff stuff with the 2008 financial collapse. It was uh, an interesting opportunity to be speaking with hedge fund managers frequently and trying to figure out how, if anything, they they made money or you know trying to price these random securities like CDOs and, and all of this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of interesting fun stuff there. I did that for a number of years before that company got sold to Mitsubishi Financial. So that got shut down as well. And now I consult with Trade Ideas LLC, which is a, a scanning and alerting and, and algorithm building service, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit as long, you know, do my own kind of Twitter and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So I've been in the game in different places for a long period of time, just kind of batting around the market. Uh, for the designations, right, I've got my CMT. You know, I got turned on to that by a lot of the stuff that I saw coming out, one of which, Michael, is actually a fairly long time ago or feels like a long time ago. I remember sitting down and reading your lumber versus gold paper, which was kind of cool. So that was one of the reasons. I like to see that there was a lot of people out there that were looking at the market as a little bit of a different way than, you know, trying to tell a story or or the financials of the company or something like that. And then the other one is the CAIA, which is an alternative, chartered alternative investment analyst. So this was more back in the hedge fund days when everyone was trying to figure out all these weird securities. So it's a little bit of a little bit of a history about me to get us started. On the CAIA designation i've considered doing that myself a while back it, i get the sense that it may not be as in demand as it used to be because a lot of the alternative hedge fund edge you can argue really went away especially with qe3 when it became a story of purely large cap cheap beta do you think that we're maybe re-entering a phase where there's going to be interest in alternatives or are we back to let's just go cheap vanguard type funds I I think it may actually be coming back, right? So I'm I'm going to play to my bias a little bit. Still still paying my dues after having this thing for for ten years, but you know um, I I think we're in agreement on on this with a lot of the tweets I've seen you do that you know just because the market may be done going down for a period of time doesn't mean it's going to go back up, and we may us old folks who have been around and trading investing during the great financial collapse remember kind of the lost decades. And that, in my opinion, is the environment where a lot of this stuff will shine, right? So if people are going to get back into alternative or as I call them, just weird investments, 
you think it would be around now if anything we're just you know buying and and yoloing tech that doesn't make any money or or bankrupt video game stores and stuff like this is no longer going to work i think it's going to be a little bit of a sweet spot for more active management and less just kind of buying voo and just waiting for it to hit a new all-time highs all right now of course alternatives don't just necessarily have to be asset classes it's really ultimately about providing an alternative return stream which you can do right with an active systematic strategy so it doesn't have to necessarily be some exotic instrument it can just be the sequence of returns right i always go back to path is ultimately what drives everything and it's also i think underappreciated by a lot of the fintwood community if they talk in terms of macro talk through how you went about the process of going from somebody who understands asset allocation did maybe more discretionary prop trading to maybe uh, focusing more on the algorithmic side and and what maybe drew you more to that in uh to put it shortly it was kind of getting my butt kicked so back in the day so this is when i used to trade prop just dating myself a bit here but this was before even reg nms for people who don't know that was kind of a regulation that was put into the market to make sure that you couldn't really get filled um outside of the bid ask and and did all of these things kind of post computerization of the market so before all of this and before the HFTs and this kind of stuff, you could there was a lot of games you could play. I don't even know if I'd consider calling what I what I did um, in university and stuff trading so much. It was uh, there was no dark pools or really hidden orders or anything like that. You could see institutions buying or selling on the tape and on the level two. So we we played a lot of these games and they were very profitable games and you know they helped me pay for university and get a little kickstart in life and all of that, but they kind of completely went away as the market got more and more competitive and computerized and and high frequency. So when I spent my years away from the market and and always interested in investing and stuff and looking at different hedge funds, then when that company got bought out, I just sat back down and I said, okay, well, I'm just going to take my little bit of the buyout of this company and I'm going to just day trade it and everything will be fine. And, you know, proceeded to go back to what I thought would have, what worked before and what I uh, assumed would just work again, and, and it absolutely didn't. Right, I ended up getting you know completely <laughs> destroyed for a period of time. Thankfully, I understood risk management, so it wasn't that bad. Around that same time, I remember one fund that I I went to. I used to go visit all these fund managers and sit down and say, as the guy who understood trading and markets, say, okay, what do you do? Where is your risk and where would that potentially affect the investors that we have that are interested in allocating some money to your fund? And one of them, I remember, just completely knocked my socks off because most hedge funds you went into, there was you know tons of traders and a receptionist and Bloomberg terminals and really high-end operations. And one that I walked into, there was one guy in an office with a just wearing shorts and a t-shirt in the middle of Manhattan. And had just a giant big button on his desk, like a big red button. I, and I remember asking him just right away, what's that button for? And he says, you know, that's for, God forbid, another plane hits a tower or, or something like this. And when I went to talk to him about what he was doing, it was the first kind of fully, I don't want to say black box, but the fully systematic fund that I ever really looked at. And when I was going over his returns and what he was doing, it was not only market beating but he just seemed to have kind of the best life of all of the traders that i saw we, he wasn't you know he didn't i have obvious signs of hypertension and wasn't running around screaming at his traders and this kind of thing um so i had a, a really good conversation with this guy and we went out to drinks and and everything and it seemed like this was kind of the the thing that i wanted to target so when i was going back and trying to trade for myself again I remembered this one trader and I said, okay, even if this might not be the most profitable way to trade, I'm sure there's traders that are more discretionary who could could beat me any day of the week. It just seems to be kind of the best life because you're detaching yourself from a lot of the decision making, right? And, you know, if you're not on FinTwit, people aren't yelling at you all of the time, then it makes for a pretty easy existence when you're simply following your rules, right? You have them, you know, over the long run, you'll end up with some outperformance, with some alpha, and you're just kind of sitting back and letting that happen. The problem, I think, is, you know, to your point about if you're not on Fintwit, is that if you are on Fintwit, people don't seem seemingly 
really understand what rules based means. And they then can't separate out the analysts from the results, which are a function of the rules, not the architect of the rules. Yes, but right, it, it's one of those things that you're you're correct, right? People go after and say, "Hey, you know, how come you didn't see this thing coming?" And and quite often, you know, the response would be, "Well, I did." But the system that I run necessarily didn't. But if, and this is the problem with FinTwit, if you smooth out all of those results over time, you end up doing more with less work, in my opinion, with a systematic approach. I mean, I did a tweet the other day about how, you know, you have to stay systematic, I think, for your mental health more than anything else. Because we have a bias in our mind. The the times that we saw something coming or the times that, uh, you know, we would have made a good trade discretionarily or if we had stepped in front of our system and changed something. And I know for, for you, for what you do, you just can't legally. But the times that I would have stepped in and, and changed something or or, you know, overwrote based off what I saw, it's easy to remember those, but then you forget all of the times that you would have also stepped in and done something, and that would have created a a loss or an underperformance in the long run. So, you know, I think a lot of this when it comes to people not understanding or or people, you know, having a hard time with dealing with systematic returns and understanding that again, they may not be as good as, you know, the best discretionary trader out there, but you know, sometimes I would even doubt a lot of the things that you see about discretionary trading. But in the long run, not only is the systematic trader probably, in my opinion, going to come out ahead, not only financially, but mentally, but then at the same time, you know, if you're talking scalability, you're talking, you know, the most important asset we have, which is our time, you know, how can we reduce and, you know, again, live more of a life while not really being stuck in the day to day and worrying about every kind of uptick and downtick, which as somebody who's done both sides, I remember when I used to leave the prop firm every day, and this was I was 18, 19, uh, when I was trading prop. And even then, with all the energy levels you have at that age, when I would leave the prop firm every day after putting on, you know, 250, 300 trades a day, I felt like I was hit by a truck. I was going to bed at a, as an 18 year old at, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night sometimes. So, you know, it's the balance between how much alpha do you want to try to stick out by being discretionary versus how much do you actually just kind of want to live life. Right? Yeah. I think it's also, there's a, there's an aspect of diminishing returns. If you're a discretionary trader, in other words, yeah, you know, there's a temptation to want to absorb as much new information and think through how things might change or not change based on different data points. That incremental new information that you're spending the time getting probably doesn't add very much, could even be negative in terms of the attribution, because there's always a degree of randomness and, and luck when it comes to the results. Yeah, and, you know, a human being only has so much bandwidth, right? So, you know, going into some of these hedge funds office and seeing the manager with four TVs up on his wall and having, you know, Bloomberg business and CNBC and Fox News. And then he has, you know, seven different monitors where he's watching every single market all at the same time. And, you know, the guy's probably 45 or 50 and he looks like he's 90. And then going to some of the quant offices where they're, you know, just working from a laptop or a single monitor and they're they're not paying attention to, well, FinTwint wasn't a thing at the time, but they're not paying attention to the news. They're not uh, focused on this thing, they're focused on their process. You know, I think you just make way better decisions when you get to the point where um, I'm not saying everyone should become a quant or everyone should become a black box. I'm certainly not a, a fully kind of quant um, black box type trader. But when you develop a process and you focus entirely on that process in the long run, you know, you're going to be able to stick in this game longer, which is, again, it's not something that. 2021, 2020 kind of meme stock people looking to get rich overnight. They don't think about that. But if you're really trying to make a go of this, myself, who's 35 now, I hope that I'm going to continue to be doing this when I'm 50, 60, 70. So you need to kind of make sure that you're looking after yourself and you're not just getting completely brain fried. So, you know, the, if there is a takeaway that I always want to leave people with is that if you're interested in trading in systems, again, understand that there's going to be times where your system's going to underperform. There's going to be times where your system's going to overperform. 
but I really truly believe you'll be in the game way longer than people who are just trading by feel or what they see in the news or trying to chase, you know, the latest bubble or kind of the latest fad. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of this the the emphasis on on the the time efficiency. I mean, uh, you know, if you're if you're in the industry and you're trying to launch funds, the dirty secret which I have no problem outright saying is, you know, 90 something percent of most in quotes, portfolio managers of mutual funds of ETFs, whatever it is, they're marketing, right? They have to be out there largely talking up their own book. I mean, everyone's biased and they're trying to build a business and that takes a lot of time and effort. And having a systematic approach frees up your time to talk about the process and try to get that that word out there, right? To to hopefully grow your AUM and do kind of all this stuff. So it's, it is an interesting and important dynamic. Now, I always go back to this point, Michael, that there's every strategy Uh, is a function of three things, right? So one is your signal. Two is the look back period on the signal. And then three, the one which is the most underappreciated is the opportunity set with which you express your trades, uh, your signals on. Even if you were just a straight up momentum trader, if you were to use a momentum signal on the S&P of the last decade, you, you did fine. If you were to use the exact same momentum signal on an emerging market ETF, you got your ass handed to you. So there is a, a real important consideration that has to go into what it is you're trying to trade as opposed to just the signal that's telling you to trade. Talk about those three dynamics from your vantage point, signal, look back period, and the opportunity you said, because I think that latter one is really a big one that, that people need to think through more. Yeah, so the the, the main system I use, and, and this is one of the, the things that I love uh, consulting with trade ideas is a system that I build called uh, TI strength, right? So trade ideas strength. And in just like you mentioned with relative strength, that's kind of my my focus and my forte. So the idea came actually when I was taking my CMT. So I will give uh, I will give credit for them. We ended up studying Ned Davis research who has a, a Fab Five system where he basically just kind of ranks what he's looking at for, you know, a, economy and and markets and all of this and then ranks the market on kind of a one to five system and then decides whether whether to deploy capital or not. And everything I had kind of done in the past was a little bit more binary it was, you know, if then, you know, we all know the um, the 10 month moving average system. If, if you don't, you can you can look it up. It's a fairly well-known system. Basically, you're along the market if the market's above the 10 month moving average and you're out when it's when it's under for myself, I'm a little bit more um, short term than I think probably yourself. Well, definitely yourself, and then uh, maybe a bit of the audience. Uh, my whole time is in the measure of weeks to to maybe a month. So, but, but, by the way, so I'm, I'm, I'm so the time frame actually for my own approach is is more akin to that. It's not really long term. Okay, at all. which which actually has been the problem, right? Because if you were to use a ten month moving average, you would have probably done better off with the major trends in large cap, whereas if you were very short term, where there's a lot more noise in emerging markets or small caps, that's where the death by a thousand cuts kind of kicks in. Yeah. And well, and I, I felt that in, in the in the system that I came up with this year focused on uh, basically entirely US stocks, right? It's just the the data set that I had to play with and it's kind of my my focus as well. So using the the kind of a ranking system and, and understanding that the goal is to be always invested. Basically, just using the concept of relative strength, there's a whole bunch of um, studies that have been done on relative strength. The, the Meb Faber study on the uh, top three, the top, if you basically hold the top three sectors on a rolling 12 month basis, that seems to show some outperformance. And again, there's a whole, whole myriad of of studies that we can go through. So that kind of got me thinking between these two concepts of ranking, which I had never really looked at before being kind of a binary trader of, you know, if this, then that. Um, and then combining that with uh, this concept of relative strength and the fact that relative strength and trend seems to uh, persist longer than it should if the market was random, uh, had me kind of develop this system where essentially what I do as opposed to People who just define relative strength as as how much on on a rolling you know six month or twelve month return basis, just basically going in and saying and and talking to the other traders that, that work with me in trade ideas and traders that I know around FinTwit, and I just kind of started surveying people and say okay what indicator or 
you know, moving average or chart pattern or whatever it is. Just tell me what you would consider a strong chart. So, you know, in my talks with uh, JC from All Star, you know, he always talks about how he really likes stocks where the RSI or whatever momentum indicator can never get oversold. Um, so then I say, okay, well, let me put that in the system and and weight it based off of uh, what the kind of back test showed me. You know, when I was talking to uh, my friend Brian Shannon from alphatrends.net, he's a big anchored VWAP guy, and he says, oh, if it's above its year-to-date anchored VWAP, I think that's a strong stock. And combining and, and taking all of these together, I basically was able to build this ranking system. So simply put, it would be something like if the stock's over, it's 200-day moving average, uh, give it a point. And if it's over, it's year-to-date anchored VWAP, you know, give it a couple points. And if the RSI is unable to get over, sold, give it a couple points. And then have that kind of fed into a system and say, if rotating into... Uh, the top five I did for the back test, it works the same with the top 10 and, and the t- top 25, just reduce returns, but also reduce volatility. But rotating into these things constantly based off this ranking all of the securities in the market over time, what is this yield? So um, a yearly, uh, so basically I, I did the back test from 2017 um, to date. And then I did. I started forward testing this, or, or trading it in real time, and then testing it in real time from about, I believe, the end of 2020. This was great. So the reason I chose 2017 to date, I've always, for my style, I always kind of worry about going too far back, and that's because of the changes that I've seen in the marketplace over time. But 2017 captures, you know, the 2018, 2019 kind of bear markets. It captures the the bull markets we had after that. It, it captures the 2020 craziness. And then watching to date, I noticed just a consistent uh, relative outperformance. Um, and the idea and the thing that I really ended up loving this is that it ended up capturing a lot of the news stuff with not needing to understand the news and myself not being able to understand the news. I don't watch any of the uh, the CNBCs, I try to avoid. I have the little Explore tab removed from my phone for Twitter. I, I try to kind of live in a vacuum as much as I can. But just understanding that this concept of relative strength just basically looks at what the institutions are not selling when there's market sell-off. So for 2020, for example, it was your Zoom and your Pelotons and your uh, you know your mRNAs and that kind of stuff. And then at the beginning of uh, 2022, you know, there was a lot of oil and gas and, and wheat and, and things like this. So being able to rotate uh, periodically ends up certainly helping. Um, now, when it, comes to, when it comes to trigger point, it was just that kind of constant rotation. You know, you would look at the, you would look at the list and pick the top, however, um, at the end of the week. And then if they broke Friday's high on Monday, you would purchase them. If not, you would you would sit in cash. Now, I'm sure there's a little bit more sophisticated way of, of using something else but cash. But um, myself, is, as a, trying to keep it as simple as possible, because I find that helps my trading the best, this simple concept of rotation actually really, really changed the game for me. And, and on the, those rotations, are you... Are you- drilling down to individual securities or is it more broad based type of type of funds or sectors that you're you're looking at it's always individual securities um my reason for it is because as a retail guy and as um trade ideas as a company that that services the retail guy we're not really as concerned with liquidity as institutional kind of players so uh, you know, everything that we're looking at is is plenty liquid over uh, a million shares average volume. But we have that benefit of being retail people where we can be in and out a little bit easier and a little bit quicker. Uh, if I were to build something for the institutional space, however, I would probably look a little bit more in the ETF world where you kind of need that that more kind of mega liquidity. But presumably you need to have the you, you want to see the tailwind, right? So I always go back to Schwager's Smart Wizards book. I forget who it was, but there was this kind of constant theme that, you know, stocks are kind of like a school fish, right? They tend to move together and it's hard to know exactly which is going to be at the top of the pack or leading the pack, but 
you know that if they're all moving in a sort of monolithic way, you're going to make money because the the co movement is there, right? So so and that kind of kind of goes back to your point about you know top three sectors and momentum that way. In terms of the last year, given how I would argue frustrating it had been, at least in my world. What were what were some of the things that your own system was picking up on, and where were you positioning, and how? It, it was a lot of oil and gas, and and you know, a full disclosure that the system, you know, is I think it was plus five percent if followed perfectly. Um, you know, with slippage and and commissions and that kind of thing, it was you know probably in the uh, cup up a couple percent, which again is I'm proud of for for certainly last year, but. Just so everyone's clear, we're not talking about you know a computerized system that it's going to make you a billion percent a year. But uh, the way I looked at last year is kind of any landing that you could walk away from was a good landing. But it just shows it basically looks because it's ranking things based off what people would consider strong and and these, which is when I boiled it down after talking to to many traders while building this system, it's, you know, over key moving averages. It's, you know, you can sum a lot of it up by position and year range. You know, how high is the thing? You know, we know that buying 52 week highs and selling 52 weeks lows works way better than the opposite in the long run. So just by doing that, by ranking all of the stocks in the market, you're right, you generally see themes, right? So th- what the system tries to do is tries not to wait too heavy in a sector. So, you know, if the first, if, the, you know, this top 25 symbols are all oil and gas, it will buy the top one, maybe two from oil and gas, and then it will go down to try to look at uh, gold or look at something like this when it comes to trying to diversify in some kind of respect. Again, as as a system for retail traders, but it was the beauty of this, and I actually wrote an article for the CMT, technically speaking, when I went through the entire back test, is you will be shocked if you really focus on relative strength, how it understands the news way better than you do. And I, I believe this is just because, right, basically you're when you're trading relative strength, you're piggybacking off large institutions that have MBAs that study the news and and go through all this kind of stuff, right? They do all of this for you. So I don't need to understand why Zoom wasn't getting sold with the rest of the market in March of 2020. I don't need to understand why oil and gas wasn't really being sold with the market in the beginning of 2022. But just by sorting things by how strong they are and by sorting by relative strength, it, it, again, my theory about why it works is that you're basically just piggybacking on what's happening. And then there's the concept of tax loss harvesting, right? Near the end of the year, we saw basically all the beaten up stocks get even worse. You know, you you had that uh, that crash call that was awesome. And I think what happened there is everyone's, if you're a hedge fund manager and you're down 80% on one position, and if you sell that, you get to recoup a little bit of tax credits from the, the man. And then if you're up on your oil and gas plays, if you sell those, you have to pay the government. It just kind of makes sense. So there's a lot of headwinds and tailwinds when it comes to why relative strength works with under out needing to understand the news and just puts you in the stuff that the, the news would be talking about anyway. Oh, I, I appreciate you saying crash call, but as I always say, it was was conditions. It wasn't a crash, but also I used the word imminent back then because the relative strength of the leading indicators of volatility were also very extended. So in my mind, and given the sentiment and all the other things you just mentioned, when I put that thread out, it was like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen now. Right, because otherwise lumber would start turning back because it's massively oversold. Utilities would start uh, turning back because it's massively overbought. Right, and we'll talk about how that I think is playing out into this year. But there are some interesting, big, I would argue, relative movements that are starting to take place as everybody is still very, I think, bearish sentiment wise. We'll touch on that. So just just so people know how I generally use this system. And that's why I said, you know, the back tests, if the system is followed perfectly, I combine this with kind of old school technical analysis where, you know, I'll I'll use the list as my guide and say, okay, I know these names have a statistical advantage because they're relatively strong and and I've I've tested everything in this list. Now let me go through and, and take a look at them. The 
only use that I've seen for technical or for Fibonacci's that I've seen work consistently is um, in profit targets when there's no other kind of thing to look at. So I think JC does this a lot where he will use the 1618 um, projection on stocks that are making new highs or new all-time highs as a, as a way to go. I personally, and I know there's a lot of technicians that will yell at me for this, but I personally believe a lot of the self-fulfilling prophecy stuff when it comes to technical analysis. You know, people, uh, gold, for example, I think is uh, is doing well now because there's probably a lot of allocation occurring to it in, in um, investment advisors and that kind of thing because they look back at the last year and they want the back test to look good and they say to their clients, okay, if you were in gold, you would have done better than being in tech or something, so let's allocate you to a lot of gold. So I believe there's a lot of that going on. So if a Fibonacci is easy and, and well-noticed on the chart, then, then possibly – but I just find it a little bit too subjective for me. And my I know myself and my own personal trading said the more subjective something gets, the more I'll get in trouble with it. Yeah. By the way, and, I'll, I'll, I'll add a quick note on that because I'm I, I'll, I'll be I'll be very forthright this. I mean, I've had people on on these spaces that are believers in Fibonacci, and I, I I'm with you, Mike. It's like I, there's so much subjectivity in something that's supposed to be number oriented that it's hard to back test. And I always am cynical about anybody that references any school of thought unless you can actually codify it, right? Yes. And I think that's that's the problem I see, at least with Ellie Wave, that it's, it should be more science. And the moment that it's more art, you don't know if it's if you can trust it. I, I have problems with something. So I, I think a lot of trading is knowing yourself. I think that's, that's a huge part of it. And for me, I know, um, you know, I, I just said there that if I can't, if I can't physically backtest why something is going to work, I have a really hard time um, having conviction in it and trusting it. Um, I'm way easier. It's way easier for me to suffer drawdowns. It's way easier for me to, um, you know, kind of get my ass kicked around. If I know that I have done the work and I have tested my system and over the long run, um, it will end up working out. So when it comes to something like uh, Fibonacci's and and things like this, I get a really hard time. Um, you know, even I think it's way easier to back test something like your traditional chart patterns. You know, um, bull flags and bear flags and and things like this than the the actual projections out there. So when it comes to and and you mentioned just the using the Fibonacci as kind of profit target um, type of thing. Uh, for me, I generally just want to try not to predict um, is is part of my goal as well. So what I'll do more for for profit targets or profit taking is take a look from um, some sort of trailing metric, a, a moving average, or an ATR trailing stop, or or, or something like that. Because again, these are things that I can I can look at and I can quantify and I can go back on all of my trading history and say, hey. If I had done X, Y, Z, how would it have worked? As opposed to trying to, um, you know, tr trying to kind of battle with this subjectivity. Because as soon as it gets subjective, again, for me, things start to fall apart. Yeah, and, and I also think that, you know, you always have to consider the the sample size, right? It's like you have all these people saying, oh, this is like the 70s. Okay, the 70s only happened once, right? I mean, it, it's hard to really... I get it, right? It's always uh, tempting to kind of look at the most recent past when it comes to Fibonacci or other things. And I understand what your point about Mike is about, you know, you tend to not go too, too far out in time, but you do have to consider the sample size, the end with which you're uh, doing your back test. Now, you had mentioned to me um, that, interestingly enough, you had some experience uh, or exposure to the Bitcoin side of things with Bitcoin mining. Oh, yeah. uh, you forgot that you mentioned that. Right. So so I'm curious, maybe just for the audience, uh, what is it that you were involved in on that end? And um, and let's talk about the most recent action because I, I put out that tweet a couple of times, I, you know, uneducated speculation is back. And people think I'm talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about just, well, the return of the rocket ship emoji <laughs> is kind of what's happening, right? Uh, so just talk about that background real quick. Well, it's funny just to, to go on the rocket ship emoji thing. I would love, I'm not, I'm not a a programmer, but if I was, I think it would be absolutely hilarious to have somebody back test, scrub Twitter, 
and back test the amount of rocket ship emojis as some sort of oscillator. The I, only perfect strategy it, that would be exactly, exactly. Yeah. this many rocket ships sell. When the rocket ships stop by, you're probably going to be a billionaire in no time. But yeah, my uh, my Bitcoin history was hilarious. Um, this was 2000. 17 or so just right near that or right after that top um the the first top uh there was a benefit of living in canada and being canadian is that in the currently still but in the beginning uh we were really big on the mining we were a place that miners would go a lot because we have the advantage of fairly cheap power combined with the fact that it's cold, right? And and Bitcoin miners run hot and they run a lot of power. So I was approached by a gentleman in my area who was basically trying to build the, I don't know, Goldman Sachs of crypto. And this, again, this was before kind of everything. And, and at the time, it was a really brilliant idea. He had his own miner in the area. So the the we were going to mine. He was also a cybersecurity expert and had hired a bunch of other cybersecurity experts. So people who had worked with CSIS, which is the Canadian, um, I guess, CIA or NSA equivalent. Um, he had helped design the software for Europe to help keep the missile dorks closed. Like, you know, these guys were serious, serious business. And this was before uh, there was really you know, treasures as a cold storage solution were just coming out, right? Just to, to date everything that was going on. So we created this thing. And, and my role was to help with the risk management, to to trade out of the coins that were being sold, and to um, help build arbitrage strategies. Because back then, there still was. You could, uh, you know, the Sam Bankman freed guy, this is basically how he got started, where you could buy Bitcoin on one exchange and sell it on the other exchange and actually have a spread enough that there was enough to, to profit on. But um, all of this was amazing. And we were actually one of the first, if not the first company that was actually promised uh, full insurance on coins from uh, Lloyd's of London, which is a massive insurance firm. They ended up, you know, walking through our offices and looking at our contingency plans and how we were going to store it. And, you know, it was like a nuclear key solution where you had to get five of us in a room at the same time to to put in a code. And then we had codes to put in if we were under duress. It was, it was a whole thing. It was actually a really fun ride. It's kind of interesting that you look at the other side of the crypto world. And I got to see that as well, where we were bought by a company out of uh, Spokane ended up buying our company because they liked what we did. But then watching this gentleman who had bought us was the fanatical side of crypto. You know, I was, as the market was crashing, I was the whole time selling, saying, hey, we should sell our, our crypto reserves that we had mined at the time, getting in fights with this guy all along the way, uh, ended up doing some you know, weird, freaky loans, all this stuff. You can look a lot of this stuff up to the Hyperblock was the end of the company it was traded on the um, Canadian Stock Exchange, which is kind of like the pink sheet boards for Canada and ended up going under. So I, I got to see the innovation to the cool ideas to the, the really interesting people working in crypto and, and the what they were trying to do, which was uh, interesting and noble at the time, and then seeing the large money and, and the fanatical ownership and everything come in and, and crush it all down. So I basically got to see like a little FTX in real time. It was just, it was fun as somebody who was at least young at the time because I had taken a lot of my uh, compensation in share certificates for now a company that's not worth anything. By the way, that that term fanatical I hit on that all throughout the last year and a half, two years, right? That when an investment becomes religion, it's time to lose faith. Mm -hmm. And that's a real benefit of the systematic trading, right? Because presumably, if you were systematic the last two years in the cryptocurrency space, you were following either a simple momentum trigger or even a moving average trigger, you'd be way out ahead relative to the holders. Well, and it's it's funny, this this kind of long history that I have in this market, it it all comes back to this that same that same concept where 
Uh, and I, I think it might just be, you know, you have to be in this game for a while. You have to be an old man. Um, I've seen the the boom and the bust, right? I've seen the, um, as when I was working with these hedge funds, the common, common thing I would see, and I know you're, you're saying, which I love that there's no, um, uh, no gurus, just cycles. Because I would see, for example, I saw a hedge fund go from 100 million to 4 billion during the great financial collapse where their job was to buy distressed debt. So what they would do is they would short the equity and they would buy the debt of companies that were going under like Lehman and uh, you know Citigroup and, and all of these really distressed companies. You could short the equity and then buy the debt. And then your hope is if the company goes bankrupt, the, ex- the equity is worth zero. And then the debt, you hopefully can get a little bit of return or some money back on. And they did phenomenally and they raised a whole bunch of money. But when the market recovered and there wasn't so much distressed debt to find, then it goes bankrupt. And I, and I saw this kind of over and over and over again with different things. And, and it brought me back to this one guy sitting with his feet up in uh, in the middle of, of Manhattan. He was actually in the Lipstick Building, funny enough, uh, who just had a system. And it was a very simple, uh, momentum-based, trend-following system. Some years, he beat the market by a handful of percentage. And uh, when he didn't beat the market, he at least uh, limited volatility. And then you kind of stretch that out over a long period of time. And, you know, you know, do you want to be the guy who kind of burns hot and burns out? Or do you want to be the guy who... Uh, continues to do well and and perform and and make alpha, but is always there to kind of fight another day. That also relates to something that I really do believe, which is that you know they say that hope is not a strategy. You often hear that line, "Hope is not a strategy." I completely disagree with that, right? Because at least if you're systematic and you've done your back testing and you know the causation, you know that there's something. At some point, the cycle comes your way. You don't know exactly when. Right. Mm-hmm. But every day that goes by, you're closer to the cycle favoring your systematic approach, which might be in a dislocation or a drawdown. You have to hope for that to see it through, right? For the cycle. Because if you don't have hope in a, in a trading strategy, you're going to abandon it. Um, I think that's, that's actually really important. And that's where being systematic gives you confidence that the hope is not misguided. Uh, being systematic, but then also doing your own work, right? Which is something that you probably get a lot of resistance to on on FinTwit as well, right? A lot of people just want to say, hey, uh, I want to read this tweet and I want to make a trade based off this tweet and then, and then go for there. But I really think it's important to to do your own work and to build your own system, even if it's um, taking from someone else's system. Like, it, you know, if someone invests in a... A uh, systematic ETF or or a mutual fund or a hedge fund or something out there, I, I think that's that's great and that's fine. But you have to understand what it is that you're getting into. So the the hope helps, but understanding kind of the ins and the out of it. It's it, it's like if you were to drive a car, you should at least have some basic knowledge about how a car works under what conditions a car can work, under what conditions a car can't. So you're not taking your Tesla and trying to like go mudding with it or off-roading or, or something like that, right? So the more kind of work, and again, work doesn't mean building your own from scratch. It could say, for example, you know, reading the research of the person who's putting together the system and, and understanding what, okay, this is going to work, this is going to fail, this is going to be, you know, this is an environment where it's going to do good and this is an environment that's going to do bad. I think that really helps. And that was one thing that I did in the hedge fund space where I would sit down with an investor and say, you know, these hedge funds were sometimes crazy. They would do things like, they would do crazy things. Like there was one who just invested in antique cars in London and that was the hedge fund. So I would sit down with them and I would just paint out that picture. And the problem with buy and hold is that no one really buys and hold. And the problem with investing in, in longer term systems is that people will pop in and then they'll have, you know, a bad year or a bad quarter or something, then they'll leave immediately. And more likely, more often than not, the moment they leave, that's when the the system turns around. So the more you understand and you can look at it and say, okay, this system is struggling now. And let me look at the market environments and saying, yeah, it should struggle now, right? If I was trading, uh, you know, I, I mentioned with the system that I was going to trade that it, it it at least made money this year. That was great. But it wasn't, you know, an, an insane um, stand-up year for something that is high touch as it is. 
But I can look at that and I can say, I can look at the market and I can look at the system and say, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't swing for the fences and I didn't make insane returns this year. But that's okay because I understand the system. I understand when it will work and when it won't. And if we get into a sideways market or a trending market, I'm fairly confident that I'll start to outperform again. Yeah, I was literally saying to myself, preach as you're saying that. It's, <laughs> it's true. It's like, and this is, it's not even, it's not even something you, you like that's something you can actually back to. So there's a, they call it the Morningstar curse, right? So if you look at uh, the, the funds that are five star over the last three, five years, over the next three, five years, they tend to be one or two star. Meanwhile, those that were the one or two stars tend to be the five stars for the next cycle. But you're right, people, whether it's short-termism or falling for narratives, whether it's buy and hold or strategy development, they're constantly trying to chase the next hot dot, which is largely based on recency bias. And the reality is the biggest returns come on dislocations, right? And a drawdown is sort of the quantitative metric for a dislocation, whether it's buy and hold or anything, right? It's... It is. It, it's funny to me how the the academic work and the practical reality is out there, but uh, <laughs> if you understand this, yeah. It, well, and I don't know. The, there's one thing looking at a a spreadsheet of returns, um, and you know, just looking at or an equity curve, and you know, you look at an equity curve. Maybe it's a a five year equity curve. You know, for for the equity curve of the system I have, you know, when it's compared to the SPY, and this is on on Tradedia's website, it, it it looks phenomenal. But people just look at the bottom the bottom left and the upper right, and they say, okay, well, that's the return it made. It's great, but they don't. You know, it, it's one thing to look at that equity curve, and that's the next thing to go through and say, oh, here's a four month period of time with negative or stagnant returns. And then here's the 2020 crash where, you know, the the drawdown of the system was 20%. And even if they do that, even if they go through and do that work and they look at it, it's one thing to look at that. And then it's the other thing to actually kind of feel it, right? So um, when there's a system out there and say the average drawdown of the system is 10%, you you look at that and you say, yeah, that's fine, just down ten percent. That I can deal with that. But so when you're actually sitting there down ten percent, that's generally when the person who hasn't done the work capitulates, right? Gets out, and then yeah, they're chasing the next fund that didn't draw down that ten percent in that period of time. And again, like clockwork, <laughs> that will be the time that the original system turns around and the system that they invest in uh, ends up uh, ends up tanking. Which is why. Even as someone who trades and invests and builds system, I do think the majority of the world would be better with a, a basket of ETFs and not looking at it because this, you're right, the the chasing the dragon, the chasing the high ends up being um, the downfall to a lot of people. I believe that, you know, you, like the core and satellite approach, again, I'm not an investment advisor, I'm Canadian and all that kind of stuff, but um, the... The way a lot of people will look to diversify in assets, I also think it makes sense to diversify in systems. So, you know, if, and and this is kind of my thinking, is that if we're going to go into a long period of time, the reason I think that there may be a lost decade or however you want to mention it, is just the the leadership is changing. And I think that's going to take a long time to sort itself out, especially you're looking at something like the SPY, which is cap-weighted. But you're right. I think a diversification of active and passive is kind of the way to hedge all of your bets. Because, you know, during uh, 2000 or 2020 and all of those things, if you weren't in a cap weighted index the entire time, it was hard to, to have any kind of outperformance. But if we're going to go into a uh, lost decade or, or a lost period of quarters or years, then not being in something that is systematic and kind of rotational is going to make you underperform. So um, what I will just say is that as you increase the touch of any system, as you increase the amount of times that you interact with a system or the amount of times the system trades, you're generally increasing uh, overall risk in kind of some way. So again, just to cover my butt here. If I was looking at myself and I was managing a system like that, I would do exactly what you're talking about and diversify across uh, passive and active. So allocate X amount to passive, allocate X amount to active, 
And then within that active, I would allocate a certain amounts to different strategies. So uh, research the research the strategy, um, and then research the correlations between those strategies. So, you know, I'm trading relative strength, rotating into U.S. equities all the time. So, the other strategy you may look at may not look at relative strength, right? It may be something that's quantitative on on some other kind of metric, right? Um, and that correlation, I think, will be everything because if you're in passive and then you're, you know, that's left alone, excuse me, and you're in the and you're in the active side of things, but there's like you pick five active strategies and it turns out those five active strategies are all doing roughly the same thing, then you might as well have just kind of picked one and and stuck with it. So when I was advising clients and talking to clients in kind of the hedge fund space, it was all about how this particular fund made money and then comparing that to the other funds they were in. Because hedge fund investors aren't all in one fund. They they generally have a lot of stuff kind of spread around. So, you know, if the guy was a, a quantitative kind of day trader and, you know, the rest of their holdings they had were longer term in nature, that would be a good fit because there should be some kind of um type of uh, diversification there. But yeah, I, I think I think diversification among systems is even more important than diversification amongst assets because we know in crashes, there's a lot of correlational that's kind of going to one, but that's my opinion on it. Yeah, no, and, and that's maybe a good transition to the, for the final few minutes here, uh, Mike. So uh, I, I, am, I put a whole thread out on this. People, again, don't seem to understand chronology when it comes to analyzing things that change daily based on conditions and probabilities. Um, last week, for whatever it's worth, I think, I don't know how you view it, I think it was actually a pretty important one in that from a relative strength perspective, again, with the caveat that it's just one week, all the right things started happening that favor the bulls in the near term. So you look at discretionary against stables, big relative move. You look at utilities against the market, big relative move on the downside. Lumber to gold, big relative move on the upside. So, you know, it seems to me like there's a sentiment shift happening. Now, yes, it's coinciding with hope that inflation's coming down, no disagreements, but what's your take on where we are near term? Do you think that we're in a higher risk condition still, or could this surprise people on the upside? I think uh, I think definitely surprise on the upside. Um, and this comes, I'm just going to go a little bit old school. I know we talked a lot about systematic, but... Uh, I still like watching the markets and I still think there's some some stuff to gleam there when it comes to tape reading. But watching the markets from a short-term basis, if you go to uh, $380 on the SPY, and that's probably $3,800 on the, on the SPX, there was some unusual action taking place there. If you just like zoom real in and look at the candles, uh, it, the market refused to close below that level. And at the same time, I noticed that the equal weight indexes and the versus the cap weighted index, there's that shift happening as well. So, you know, we've seen some relative outperformance for equal weight versus cap weight uh, for, you know, a long period of time, but it really kind of picked up over the last like few days to a couple weeks. So for those who don't know, basically what that means is that, you know, the SPY is, I think, 5% Apple plus whatever Berkshire happened. Pathway owns so like 7% Apple and a lot of these big kind of tech names. Um, whereas the equal weight just it takes the same 500 stocks and just weights them all equally. So when you see the equal weight starting to dramatically outperform the cap weight, to me, what that's saying is that, okay, most stocks in the market seem to be performing very well. It's just these big names that are kind of weighing everything down. And because everyone looks at the SP 500 or in the SPY, and not going through the individual sectors and not going through the individual names. I think it leads to this problem of people are a little bit more worried, in, in my opinion, than they maybe should be. So I hate the term, but it probably is going to be a stock picker's market for the next period of time if, if this trend is going to continue. And I just want people to kind of look and broaden your horizons a little bit. You know, if you're if you've been in a lot of these unprofitable tech names or these, these uh, you know, Zooms and Pelotons and Bed Bath & Beyonds or whatever, um, these things aren't coming back. <laughs> and, and 
Generally speaking, it's never the leaders of the last cycle that end up being the leaders of the next cycle. So if you're someone who's kind of stuck in your ways and I'm going to judge the market and the market to me is big cap tech and the market to me is uh, the queues and things like that, then I, I still think you do have a reason to be worried. But if you're someone who's okay with you know cycling between different assets and if you're someone who's okay with just trading whatever is relatively strong at the time, I think, and you know, I'm, I'm talking my book here with my system, but I, I think we're going to be in for a bit of a uh, a bit of an interesting time. Yeah, I'm 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 in agreement with you. So there's there's sort of at least for me, there's you know, long term, short. I always go back to long term. It's very hard to anticipate, but there's I think some pretty big dynamics happening that are only going to be clear with a few years down the line. One, um, I always go back to the simplest answer is the right one. What caused U.S. large cap to outperform everything else was ZERP and QE. You don't have that. Emerging markets are showing signs of life. Nobody wants to touch China. Nobody wants to touch anything outside the U.S., which is probably why you might be in a multi-year cycle, finally, where emerging markets work. That's a long-term aspect. Short-term, I'm with you. I think you know the conditions are there for a continuation higher, surprising on the upside. But I keep going back to, you know, I think at some point this year, there's a credit event. If you are a believer that we are still in a bear market, you haven't had the VIX spike, you haven't had that credit spread blowout, the fact that a lot of COVID loans start uh, maturing you know, in the next year or so, if that rollover happens on higher interest rates and the market anticipates that nine months out, then you probably have some kind of high vol spike coming. But at least in the near term, I think you're probably okay. And it sounds like you largely agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I think we're in agreement there. I am worried about the credit event as well. Now, you know, this is going to be some of my home country bias, but uh, in Canada, we have fixed rate mortgages. I think you guys have them for like 25 years down there, and we have them for five. So the the Canadian housing market has been absolutely insane. I've, been, I've just, you know, personal example, I've been in this house for three years and the price doubled. And with the interest rates as high as they are, when you get these rollover in loans, and, and I'm sure there's some loans in the States that will have the same kind of rollover, it, it feels kind of 2080 where uh, you're going to have this period of time where you know maybe people could afford whatever they had before and then yeah, interest rates increase. That becomes a burden on people. The, the layoffs we're seeing all the time becomes a burden on people. So I, I wouldn't be shocked to see a credit event as well. Now, you know, with anything, as, as that's just fun for me to to talk about, but I am just going to kind of rely on my system, and I hope that it puts me in whatever does well in a credit event, uh, if we're right on that one. Uh, I think we share that uh, <laughs> that hope, which again is a strategy. Uh, everybody, please make sure you follow uh, Michael Noss. Check out his uh, YouTube channel. Uh, show some support to him here on Twitter. Uh, I am doing a Twitter space with uh, uh, Kane. Uh, Mayor Glenn Jacobs uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. That's going to be uh, fun. So if you're a uh, old school WWE fan, uh, I encourage you to to join that. Uh, Mike, I, I, I sincerely appreciate your knowledge, your candor. Uh, you're a, a good human being. Again, I say that to the audience publicly because Mike sent me some encouraging words in the filth that is Fintwit because he understands the industry and is not a schmuck. So <laughs> thank you, Mike, for that. Thank you. It's a high compliment uh, to not be a schmuck. So thank you for joining and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much.